is Professor Cordy Petabyte from Elf University, and I'm here today to give you a presentation titled, You Can Still Have Fun with Non-Fungible Tokens. Sometimes those puns even make me laugh. What is a non-fungible token? Well, there's nothing like opening up a newspaper and reading that an animated gif of Nyan Cat, a flying cat with a Pop-Tart body, sold for nearly $600,000. That'll pique your interest in this new collectible format. But what exactly is an NFT? Non-fungible. That word really doesn't help out a whole lot because most people don't know what it means. Non-fungible means something that is unique or distinguishable. So twins would not be non-fungible. This non-fungible attribute differentiates NFTs from standard cryptocurrency tokens because crypto tokens are all the same. You can exchange one for another because really, they're no different. However, just like crypto tokens, NFTs are based on smart contracts and live their lives on the blockchain. The contracts are different because they need to account for the uniqueness that makes NFTs special. But what is it? What are people buying? In theory, a non-fungible token is a unique digital identifier that cannot be copied, substituted, or subdivided, and is recorded on a blockchain that is used to certify authenticity and ownership. Because it's recorded on the blockchain, it's immutable. It can't be changed. So when you've purchased it, when you own it, this single thing, this single NFT, identifies your relationship to the entity that it describes. But what exactly do you own? Well, I like to use the analogy of a baseball card. You don't own the player on the front of your baseball card. You don't even own the rights to the photo of the player. You likely can't even republish the information on the card without getting in trouble with tops or whoever makes the card or or Major League Baseball itself. Generally, the way they think about it is this. You pretty much just own the card. But that's okay, you see, because in case you don't pay attention to such things, rare baseball cards can be worth a lot of money. And that's the point. Rare things can be valuable. And NFTs package up rarity into a nice, neat, blockchain-ready bundle and put it up for sale. Remember, it's right there in the name. Non-fungible means unique. So long as the maker is trustworthy and they won't make duplicate NFTs, you have a unique, artificially rare item. So, rare things can be valuable, but not all rare things are valuable. The problem with NFTs is they're artificially rare. Rare, desirable things are valuable. Diamonds are rare and desirable. Remember Beanie Babies? At one time, they were rare and desir desirable, but now, not so much. Sure, there are still some that are valuable, but for the most part, the bottom has dropped out of that market. But if you can create an NFT that somehow excites the public, you can make a lot of money. But for those investing in them, I would caution you to use only those funds you could potentially afford to lose. Here's some items of interest that I found out while I was studying about NFTs. NFTs generally only contain a link to the actual collectible item, the graphic art, the sound, the video, etc. 
That's because storing data on the blockchain itself is a fabulously expensive thing. At the current price of Ethereum, storing just 500 kilobytes of data would cost approximately $20,000. There are specifications for what data should be stored within an NFC and how that data should be formatted. There are several formats, but many of the central hubs for buying and selling NFTs require a specific format, ERC-721. The reason they require the NFT information to be in that format is they want to be able to display that information automatically. Here's one that I thought was very interesting. The most expensive bored ape, which was number 8817. It sold for $3,408,000. And because I'm just such a swell guy, you can see it here for free. When I was studying NFTs, I ended up going down a rather interesting rabbit hole. I discovered something called a Merkle tree. Merkle trees are data structures used for various purposes in NFT contracts. One reason you might use one is to create a pre-sale allow list or something like that. There are three types of nodes in a Merkle tree. There are leaf nodes, those at the bottom of the tree when you're looking at it inverted like this. There are items D, E, F, and G in this diagram. Their value is created by using a hash function on the original data that you're wanting to store. So, for example, if you wanted to store wallet addresses on the tree, you would store in D, E, F, and G four values for four different block addresses created by hashing those block addresses. Then the next type of, of node are parent nodes. Those are items B and C in this diagram. They sit between the top of the tree and the bottom of the tree where the leaf nodes are. And depending on the number of leaf nodes that you had, there have, there may be various different amounts of parent nodes, various different levels of parent nodes. The value of a parent node is determined by concatenating the hashes of the nodes below it and then just simply hashing that value. Now order is important because we typically concatenate them from left to right. Finally, there's the root node. This is the single node that sits up at the top of the tree and its value is created in the same way as parent nodes. In other words, take the two values below it, concatenate them together going left to right, and then hash that value and that's the value of the root node. Well, why are we talking about all of this? Well, why Merkle trees are interesting is this. They're incredibly ingenious. Because here's an interesting fact. It does not require any knowledge of the original data blocks to verify that a node belongs to our tree. All we need to know is the original piece of data that we're trying to verify. And we just need to know the direct neighboring leaf node for that hash, if there is any and the neighboring parent node hashes directly above the leaf node. If we know those things, we can use those together with the value at the root node to actually prove whether or not that address was hashed as one of those final lower leaf values. This is amazingly elegant and incredibly useful. I intend to do some further investigation on this and Hopefully, I'll be making some code available uh, somewhere on GitHub in the future. Thank you so very much for participating in today's presentation on NFTs. 
and I hope you found that you really can have fun with non-fungible tokens.